Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the first in our programme of uh, webinars, where we'll be helping you make some important decisions to plan for the future. I'm so pleased that you've decided to join us today. Um, today, we will be looking at wills and estate planning, and in future sessions, we'll also be looking at lasting power of attorney, probate, and care costs. But back to today. So who here likes to have the last word? Well, I do, which is why I've got a will in place. But for many of us, we put off making a will because it feels a bit of a daunting, difficult task. However, I've spoken to so many people in the past who've actually shared some wonderful stories of their loved ones, many of them prompted by the people, the causes, and the gifts that have been mentioned in wills. They truly are a reflective document. So <clears throat> they do provide an awful lot of comfort. And some stories come out which were perhaps a little bit less expected by the people who have actually um, started looking at them and reading through what their loved one was really all about. So today we've got guest presenters from Ashton's Legal. We've got Pat and Frankie, who are going to spend some time helping you understand a little bit more about the processes. They've also got a lot more stories than I've got to share. <laughs> and really writing a will is an empowering thing to do because it is a way, as I said, of making sure that your final wishes are actually acknowledged. The session's gonna be delivered in two parts. The first part by Pat, where she'll be talking about wills, and the second part by Frankie, where she'll be talking about estate planning. We welcome you to put your questions in the chat box at the bottom of the screen at any time. After each section, what we'll do is we'll make some time to answer those Q and A's. So shall we have a little start by, if you can go into the chat box, let us know who you are, where you're from, and anything that you would really like to get out of today. And then we'll try and try our best to make sure that we answer those questions for you. One thing that there is, is that Ashton's Legal have really kindly said that people can have a free 30 minute legal session or surgery at the end um, where you can book. And that's really an opportunity for any of you who really don't want to share what's going on, what your thoughts are in front of everybody, or also if there's just something you'd like to sort of delve a bit deeper into. So that's absolutely fine. So today's session will be around about 45 minutes long. We will have a poll at the end of each session. So please do make sure that you take part and we'll share our findings with you. And then also what we will have, to, oops, start again. And what we will have as well at the end is we'll have um, a Q and A section just to make sure, um, uh, and, and also not just the Q&A section, sorry, I've gone over that, um, but we'll also have a survey at the end of the webinar where you can just go into that and let us know what your thoughts are so that any further sessions that we do um, are even better. So without further ado, I'll, in, I'll introduce you to Pat, who will talk to you about will planning. My name is Patricia Gray and I am a senior paralegal and specialise amongst other things in the preparation of bespoke wills. I wish I had a penny or preferably a pound for every time I have been asked that question. The conversation usually starts off why bother? We are married so everything will automatically go to my husband, wife. Unfortunately, no. Only the joint assets will pass automatically to the survivor. By preparing a will, you remain in control. The decision is yours. You decide who receives your estate and in what proportions. You decide who will be your executors, acting on your behalf through your will. You decide your funeral instructions and not relying on what someone thought you might like or thought you said. Digital issues, social media, iTunes, Facebook and Twitter. Some may apply, some may not. You make decisions for any potential inheritance tax planning. You make guardianships decisions regarding your minor children. You decide on legacy gifts, which are usually given on the second death, but not always to family, friends or favourite charities. You decide where your residuary estate goes, usually on the second death. 
generally to children or grandchildren. If there are no children, then why do family members or to charity or charities? Having said that, even if there are children, people are often very generous to charities, especially those that have touched them. Ultimately, with a will, you remain in control. If you die without making a will, you die intestate. That means your estate will pass under the rules of intestacy. There is absolutely no way around those rules and a strict order of who inherits is religiously followed. I will give you a quick scenario. A married couple with children, the husband dies, leaving assets in his sole name of £400,000. All those assets will not automatically pass to the wife. Under the intestacy rules, the wife is entitled to assets of £270,000 and all the personal possessions. The remaining £130,000 is divided half between the children and half to the wife. Having said this, any assets held in joint names automatically pass by survivorship to the wife. As I mentioned, executors, who are they and what do they do? It's an important role. An executor is personally liable, which means they have a responsibility to secure estate assets and ensure the estate is administered correctly. You can have up to four executors. They must be trustworthy and sensible. For example, they must ensure that all the tax, either inheritance tax or income tax, is settled, that all of the liabilities of which they are aware are also settled before the administration of the estate is wound up. Their role is to follow your instructions in your will. Who can be an executor? Any adult over the age of 18 years. Can a residuary beneficiary act as an executor? Yes. Can a beneficiary witness a will? It is advisable that your witnesses are independent. If anyone who benefits under your will acts as a witness, they will lose their entitlement. There are two types of legacies, pecuniary and specific. Pecuniary are cash legacies and they can be given in any amount. Consider the value of your estate and then make your decision. Specific legacies are items, jewellery, car, even a house. To make life easier for your executors, it can be very useful to leave a good description of any jewellery, family heirlooms perhaps, even take photographs to place with your will. If you have a long list of personal belongings you wish to leave to various people, you may prefer to write a letter to be stored with your will, specifying the items and to whom. In this way, the letter can be updated at any time without rewriting your whole will. However, you do need, need a clause in your will referring to such letter. Family, friends and charities can receive pecuniary and or specific legacy gifts. Charities rely heavily on gifts in wills. There are many, many charities that may be personal to you for whatever reason and your gift is always welcome. If there is no will in place, children of blended families, as they are now called, but essentially step families, will miss out. You may have loved and cared for stepchildren for years, but it makes no difference. If you want stepchildren to benefit on your death, you need to include them in your will. You may not be surprised to hear, but one of the biggest causes of infighting after a death is money. Another reason why you should have a will, particularly if you have a blended family. Think of Boris Johnson, several different mothers, all those children have to be named and included. 
adopted children are treated in the same light as blood children. In most cases, on the first death, the estate is left to the spouse, partner outright. On the second death, the children, grandchildren may inherit and usually in equal shares. However, the division is not always in equal shares to the children and not always to all of your children. Lifetime gifts may have been given. There may be an estrangement or sadly a death. All sorts of reasons. If that applies, I advise you to prepare a letter to leave with your will. Explain in the unequal division or why someone is being left out of your will to your executors and beneficiaries. They may not like it, but they will make have insight into your thinking at the time you prepared your will and why you made the decision that you did. If you do not have children, then again, friends and charities could, can benefit. If you choose to leave all of your estate on the first death to your husband or wife, there is no inheritance tax to pay due to spouse exemption. On the second death, all available allowances will be applied to mitigate inheritance tax. There is no inheritance to pay tax to pay on gifts passing to charities. Inheritance tax is payable at 40%, but where at least 10% of the net estate is left to charity, the rate of inheritance tax is reduced to 36%. When someone dies, it is usually left to the executors to arrange for the property to be Not always, but generally. I have recently listened to a couple of stories from two women with two very different experiences. One woman went through a pat tactic with her daughters to sort out and clear the mother's possessions and had the most amazing afternoon laughing and look at, looking at the many items they were going through. The memories came flooding back and they were making more memories. The second woman was not so fortunate. Her mum had died and the responsibility was for her to clear her mother's property. She found a huge suitcase again in the attic, filled to the brim with photographs, letters and other types of memorabilia. She read the letters and she looked at the photographs and it made her sense of loss even greater because mum wasn't there to explain who all these people were and why some letters have been kept and others obviously not. What made those kept letters so important? She will now never know. She is now keeping a memory box for her own children, leaving a note of why items are in the box and why they are so special to her makes you think, doesn't it? Hello again, everyone. Um, there was some really thought provoking stuff there. Thank you very much, um, Pat. So now we'll go to the Q and A's for anything that perhaps wasn't covered. So we have got a question that's come in, um, which is what are the likely fees for two wills? Um, well, each solicitor has their own fee tariff. It's a bit like a supermarket. They all have charged various prices for various different things. Our wills are bespoke. So uh, we take client instructions and then we like to give a, an idea of what the fees are likely to be from those instructions. It may be that if a trust is included or there are foreign assets that would have to, the fees would then be looked at. So the prices can vary on the instructions given. Okay, thank you for that, Pat. And just out of interest, is there, is there anything as a basic will anymore? You know, it's, it's what we tend to call a standard will. Uh, and that covers a multitude of sins. So there is standard wills. And then it goes to, you know, as I say, the more complex the assets, um, the different levies are applied. OK. And so what should I do with my will um, once I've completed it? 
We store them, our clients, we offer a free storage for our wills, um, but I do know that some solicitors don't, and obviously banks do charge, but ours are free of charge storage, simply because if a, will, if a grant of probate is needed and your will goes to the probate registry, when the will is sent before the grant is issued, it has to be in pristine condition. If it isn't, then the probate registry may ask questions as to why there is even a paperclip mark. And there has to be a ready answer. So we tend to put them in the strong room for safekeeping. That's something I didn't realise, so thank you for that. Um, what should, uh, sorry, no, I've um, got another one saying about a codicil. Uh, can you explain what a codicil is exactly? You know, is it complicated to have one prepared? No, no, it's not a complicated uh, area, but perhaps Frankie would like to answer this question. Um, so codicils themselves are not difficult, but they can cause a headache to make sure that they work with the original will. Um, the biggest problem you can sometimes have is when you go to use the will and we go to get the grants um, when you died, the will becomes a public document. And not only does the will become a public document, but your codicil will as well if you've done one. So this can mean you can see both the original will instruction, which might have been leaving a gift to someone, and the codicil, which potentially takes them out um, both at the same time. So codicils are very good for simple changes, um, changes to executors, maybe changes to guardians, but anything where you're maybe changing who you're leaving things to, we would always recommend starting again with a fresh will <laughs> yeah avoid those difficult conversations between people hey um, so what else have we got on here i've got another question i don't think we've asked this one um would like to know when i should review my will and how often we suggest you review your will every five years um, you could have a will for years and years and years and it still be fit for purpose and there's no need to update it. But law does change, legislation does change. So we suggest that every five years and then if there has been significant changes, then contact a solicitor and uh, talk through those changes with them. Are there any significant changes that you would say now's the time? Uh, possibly the death, well, the death of an executor, definitely should do that and ideally if there's a death of a residuary beneficiary because then that alters the estate and you may want to leave that part of the estate that was going to the person that sadly predeceased you elsewhere okay what about if you move moving is not a problem we just need a letter with your new address and that is put with the wills both wills so that and even if one of your beneficiaries moves, it's still not a problem. Simply let us know. Uh, if a beneficiary dies and you don't want to update your will, a copy of the death certificate would be very handy. OK. And who can witness my will? Ideally, as I said in the talk, it would preferably be um, an independent adult. Uh, keep um, the witnesses as far away from the uh, people mentioned in the will as possible. It, it just can cause problems and so we don't want to start the administration of an estate with a problem let's try to keep it as clean as possible okay uh, another question just come in um can pets be included in wills um it just reminded me of a story pat where we um somebody shared with me that actually uh, most of the contents of the will was left to a pet so um could you just explain though um can pets be included as in to what happens to them after their death well, again, I think this might be one for Frankie. Um, so pets can be included in wills. It's not something we tend to see on a regular basis, um, partly because a lot of the arrangements you make with your pet might be outside the will. So you might want to find an emergency contact who can take care of the pet immediately. You might have some specific instructions about how they're to be taken care of. Where they tend to come into the will a bit is if you want them to go to a specific person and maybe leave some money for that person to help look after them. Um, but really, quite a lot of the work we do with pets is outside of the will because it's that immediate concern that you have about somebody looking after your pet and taking care of it and making sure you've got emergency contacts in place. Okay, that's brilliant. I think that's all the questions we have. Oh, one more's come in. Um, what kind of gifts can I make in my will? Well, you can make pecuniary 
or specific. Pecuniary is money legacy, so you can leave as much or as little money as you want to anyone in particular, friend, family, lots of people leave them to, to good friends because usually in, during the latter part of the life, they've needed the help and support of those friends, either emotional or physical, and it's a way of saying thank you. And also there are specific legacies, which can include, as I said in the talk, jewellery, um, a house of ours. Uh, I did have a, a couple of wills where somebody left, uh, they were a circus enthusiast, and they left and they collected over years, loads and loads of circus memorabilia, and someone got left all that. And also I had a, a woman who left her, her husband, nothing else except her rotavator. And so that was interesting too. So <laughs> wide spectrum of what you can leave. Um, yeah, I can only imagine what the garden must have looked like for her to have done that. <laughs> so uh, thank you for that. Um, I think that's everything. Um, one more question actually, does it take long to prepare a will? No, not really. We take the instructions. We like to get the wills out two weeks from the date of instructions. This is sometimes slowed down because uh, clients like to make amendments. And if someone has never made a will before and they see the draft will, it kind of focuses their mind and they suddenly think, oh, no, I didn't want to do this or especially around guardianship clauses. So um, ideally two weeks, but it all depends on the um, correspondence going back and forwards and the changes they want to make. Okay. And another question's come in is, what if your liabilities wipe out or decrease your pecuniary legacies? Thank you. Over to you. Um, so if you do not have enough money in your estate to leave everything that you want, there's a certain order uh, in how um, gifts are made. So first off, your residual estate goes. Then after that, um, what are called pecuniary legacies, gifts of money can go. And then eventually it's the specific legacies. So there's a specific order. If you run out of things, you then become insolvent. Um, and then there's a certain order in which you have to pay creditors. So priority usually is specific gifts of items or property, then pecuniary legacies. Then you get onto the residuary estate at the end. So it's worth just bearing that in mind when you're making your will. Thank you. Right, I can't see any more questions coming in. One last chance if anybody's got anything that we haven't answered. Okay, so what we'll do now is um, we'll go towards uh, the, um, the poll. I think we've got a poll coming up. I'll just check to see. There we go, if you wouldn't mind taking part. So the first question we're saying, having watched the webinar, are you considering creating or updating a will? Simple yes or no answer. I feel like we need dramatic music right now. <laughs> yeah, we do need something. Then you've got a ukulele or anything by, by the side. <laughs> okay. So over to you, Frankie. So the poll results for, um, I'm not sure if they're showing up on everyone's screen, is 88% have said they're now considering creating or updating a will versus 13% that are not currently. Um, now that maybe they've already got wills in place or it may be that they're quite happy without one. Okay, right, that's great. So thank you everybody for your contributions. Um, it's brought out some extra information. Um, oh, we've got one more question come in before we go to the next section. What if there is money left, but not enough? Oh, no, I think we've had that one. Sorry. Uh, no? Sounds a similar question about what if there is money left, but not enough to satisfy the pecuniary legacies, so it's not all wiped out. So, Right. Okay. So in that case, it will be apportioned between. Um, so in those categories that we spoke about, if you have enough potentially for it, then it starts to be apportioned amongst the category. Um, so if you've got enough of the specific, you've not quite got enough for all of the pecuniaries, then you start to apportion it amongst those ones. So they all get a apportioned amount. Hopefully that answers your question. So there's always opportunities, even during the next session, if something comes back, which is uh, based on, you know, if you've been thinking about all the information over the wills and you can still ask those questions, feel free to. 
So that leads us nicely on to the next section, um, which where we'll be talking about um, estate planning. So we'll now go into um, Frankie's talk, um, showing information on that. Thank you. My name's Francesca and I'm a solicitor at Ashton's Legal, specialising in, amongst other things, in estate planning. This is what I'm going to talk to you about today. Estate planning may sound like it's only for people with large, complex investments and lots of money, but really it's for everyone. Everyone has an estate. In legal and financial terms, your estate is everything and anything you own or have an interest in. Your bank accounts, car, home, life insurance, investments, jewellery, businesses. Well, you get the idea. Estate planning is simply an umbrella term used to describe preparing a plan of action, often involving legal documents, that help set out your wishes for your health and your finances. When preparing a plan, most people may only think about planning for their death, if at all. This can include preparing a will, a funeral plan, or nominations for life insurance policies. But estate planning can also involve planning to protect and enjoy your money and property during your lifetime. This sort of planning can include powers of attorney, retirement plans, and plans for your care. So why should you estate plan? Simply put, it can make things much easier for you and your loved ones in the future, especially should something happen to you. Knowing what you have, where to find things, and what your wishes are can make all the difference in a difficult time. Other benefits of estate planning can include choosing where your estate goes, protecting the people you wish to benefit, such as young children or adults that may be vulnerable, reducing tax burden, and reducing family fallout. I'm gonna to focus today on estate planning that relates to your wills, and in particular, inheritance tax planning. So what is inheritance tax? Well, when you die, the government charges tax on your estate, and it could be a pretty significant amount. This is called inheritance tax. The rate of inheritance tax when you die is a massive 40%. Now, there are some things that you can do to reduce or cancel out the amount of inheritance tax you pay. These can include tax-free allowances, exemptions, and reliefs. Some people have said to me, but why should I care about tax after I die? I'll be gone. That's not my problem. And it's a fair point. But others want to try and pass as much as possible onto the people or organisations that they wish to benefit. Now, Talking about inheritance tax isn't exactly fun, and inheritance tax planning can be even more dry. So I'm going to try a different approach and use POTS to illustrate tax saving options. Firstly, I'll start with tax-free allowances. Now, everyone has an allowance called the nil rate band. This is a set amount up to which no inheritance tax is paid, currently £325,000. Now you can put into this pot all of your estate up to the amount and everything in the pot you don't pay any tax on. Everything outside of the pot you pay tax on. Now you need to watch out because you can fill this pot up in the seven years before you die with any gifts that you make during that period. Now this is a pot that everyone has, but there are other pots that only certain people may get because of their circumstances. One of those is if you have property and you leave it to children or grandchildren. Now this is the residence nil rate band pot. Again, you can put up to a certain amount into this pot and you won't pay any tax on it. Currently, this is £175,000. Now, for somebody who has property and leaves things to children, they can potentially use both the nil rate band pot and the residence nil rate band pot, which could be quite a significant tax saving. There's also an extra benefit if you have a spouse or civil partner because any amount of unused pots you can then pass on to them to use along with their own pots when they die. There are also reliefs relating to business and agricultural land, where again, you might get a tax saving for those assets. These can be especially important for farming families. 
In addition to saving tax based on your circumstances, you can also save tax based on who you leave things to. Exemptions allow you to leave money and property to certain beneficiaries who are exempt from paying tax. Money, for example, left to a recognised charity is exempt, or money that's left to a spouse or a civil partner can also be exempt. Now, both the spouse part and the charity part are unlimited. You can leave as much as you want to those as long as it's left to a registered charity or your spouse or civil partner. Now, as you'll have observed, the law is rather old fashioned and it favours the traditional family setup of marriage or civil partnership and children. Whilst there are many couples out there quite happy without the requirement for a legal piece of paper affirming their relationship, I have met several couples who have ultimately decided to marry for tax reasons. Now, just going back to the charity part, in addition to gifts that left to charity being tax free, it's also possible if you use a certain amount of this part, 10% of your estate going to charity, that you can reduce the overall amount of tax your estate pays. So in a nutshell, inheritance tax planning is about identifying which pot you might be able to use and how efficiently you can use those pots together. Now, it's important to remember that your circumstances will change and what pots are available to you may change over that period. It's also possible that the government can take away pots or create new pots in the future. One way of reducing the value of your estate on your death and therefore the amount of inheritance tax due is by making gifts in your lifetime. Some of these gifts are always exempt from inheritance tax, such as gifts to charities. Others, you have to be careful of that seven year rule. Now, people are also making gifts not only for tax reasons, but simply because they're not wanting to wait until they die to pass the benefit on to the people that they love. One example is that a lot of parents potentially now are giving gifts of money to their children to help get them onto the property ladder. There are also a growing number of people handing over property to family, but continuing to live there. Now, this isn't a problem in and of itself, but you should know that this is known as a gift with a reservation of benefit, and it can give rise to all sorts of complications and potential tax liabilities. One of the questions we're often asked is whether you should use a trust in your will. Trusts have been used in many ways over the years, and I'm gonna give a few examples now. Trust can be especially helpful if you're wanting to protect your beneficiary. This may be because they're a young child and will need someone else to look after their money for them until they turn 18, or it could be because they're a vulnerable adult and you don't want to affect the benefits they receive, or you want to protect them from outside influences, bad decisions, divorce, or creditor problems. Trust can also be used to look after your partner or a particular relative you live with for the rest of their life before passing on to a beneficiary of your choice. This is usually called a life interest trust and is often set up between couples to look after the survivor of them and make sure they're provided for with a roof over their head before passing on to the children. There can be several reasons to set up a life interest trust as it can protect your estate from risk of second marriage by your surviving partner and therefore risk missing out the children. And it may protect if the surviving partner needs long-term residential or nursing care. Trust can also be set up during your lifetime, but they can be complicated due to tax rules involved. So there's three important things that I want you to remember when thinking about estate planning. One, planning gives you control. You get to make the choices and decisions rather than leaving things up to chance. Two, make sure you understand all the implications and check that what you're planning will solve the problem and not create a new one. Three, do not lose sight of your goals. You may save tax or avoid paying too much care, but you could end up not benefiting those who you want to, especially yourself. Estate planning can seem overwhelming to start with, so start small, make a list. What do you have? Where is it? Who do you want it to go to? Then you can figure out the how.
Frankie. So we've got some questions that have come in already. So the first one is, is there a limit on how much you can give away before you die? So there's no limit whatsoever. You can give as much or as little away as you would like. Um, the only thing to think about is then the position regarding tax. So um, as I mentioned, there's that seven year rule that you just have to be aware of. In addition to that, there's an amount called the annual exemption that everyone has, which is £3,000 every tax year that you can give away without being taken into account for inheritance tax. Um, so there's a few different things you can do, um, but it very much depends how much, who you're giving it to and why are you worried about tax? OK, thank you. Uh, this one I've heard quite a, a lot of times, actually. It's can I give my house away to my children during my lifetime? Yes, this is a um, particular hot topic question. Um, so you can give your house away to your children during your lifetime. The big question is, why are you giving it away? So if you're giving it away to try and save inheritance tax, then as I mentioned in the, in the video, if you carry on living in it, it won't work because as far as inheritance tax is concerned, you still get the benefit of the house. If you're giving it away to try and avoid care fees, um, that can also be a problem because the local authority look at something called deliberate deprivation of assets. So if your sole reason for giving it to your children was to avoid care fees, then they can potentially undo it or not take it into account. Um, and it's also just being aware that if your children then own your house, um, it's their asset. So if they go through a divorce, if there's any bankruptcy, then the house is taken into account. So you do lose, leave yourself vulnerable. It can be quite a risk by the sound of things. OK, thank you for that. Um, somebody has told me to check my pension nomination. Is that important? Pension nominations are something that often get forgotten about. So um, with pensions, sometimes with life insurance, you can nominate a beneficiary or beneficiaries who can receive it. So that means it can pass outside of your estate. It cannot be taken into account for inheritance tax, not go under your will. Um, and the nominations give the um, information to the people who look after your pensions and um, your life assurances as to who you would like. And you can update them on a regular basis without having to update your will. So um, it is a good thing to always just go back and have a look, have a look at what you've got in place and make sure it matches with your current circumstances. OK, then I've got what if I miss something out of my estate plan and want to add it at a later date? Is it possible? Um, so it depends what you're talking about. So if it's your will, then you can potentially add something in at a later date with a codicil or by updating it. If it's just the planning as a whole and taking into account the tax position and giving away, then that is constantly being updated. If you're thinking about documents that go alongside letters of wishes, um, letters about where your assets are, um, your nominations, you can keep updating those. And if it's other documents like lasting powers of attorney, you can update them, but you can't amend them. So estate planning is something that's worth doing all the time, um, particularly because it a lot of it is done outside the legal documents themselves. Okay. Can you tell me what the difference between a will and a state plan is, please? Um, so a will is a legally binding document about what should happen when you die. A state plan, as I um, said at the beginning, was um, it can cover a whole range of things. It's just your plan about what's happening during your lifetime and on your death. So... Um, your estate plan could potentially include um, setting up um, your retirement, getting your pension sorted out, setting up care annuities later on, sorting out a lasting power of attorney, um, writing down everything that you own, dealing with your digital side of things, what digital that you have, what passwords there are. It, it's, it's a really big thing, the estate plan. That's why I say break it all down into the little sections. Um, and just keep reviewing it. Did you tend to make an estate plan at the same time as your will or are they done separately? Um, th they can be done at the same time or separately. Your estate plan um, is always worth having in place when you look at your will because if, again, to make your will, you probably need to know what happens with your pension or what assets do you own, do you own or 
what have you got in place? So an estate plan is a really good basis to then start to set up the legal documents and to make sure they match with your circumstances. That's good advice, thank you. Um, so I've got another question here about what information do I need to bring to the meeting with a solicitor when starting the estate plan? So a really good basis is a list of everything you own, um, a list of any liabilities that you might have, things like mortgages. Um, dig out the paperwork that you've got on your pensions. Um, you might have an accountant or an IFA maybe, so they might have already looked at that. Um, they could put it in a report. Um, have an idea about, and again, who's in your family? Who do you want to benefit? Um, the main thing we really try to get to is what's your goal? Is it that you're really tax conscious? Is it that you've got a relative who's vulnerable and you're wanting to make sure that they're protected? Um, really drilling down into what is it you want to get out is probably one of the main things we get to. Pat, I don't know if there's anything else that you find when people come to make a will, it's always useful to have. Um, a, a good idea of their assets and liabilities. And um, I find the one thing that I want people to bring to the meeting is, apart from that, is to be completely honest. Um, they have to treat the real meeting like a confessional. Mm -hmm. And remember that we've heard it all before and we're not going to sit there being shocked. Uh, we need to know about children that aren't talked about, adopted children, these kind of things are vital to the will meeting because when the inevitable happens there needs to be a note and we need to know what's been going on so really their life and their honesty brilliant thank you um got something from well, one comment said it could be quite an emotional journey but I, I guess that could be very positive in terms of emotions is that right pat or yeah, it is. It is very emotional. I've had people cry at will meetings because especially one woman, her son was 18. She was a single parent. And she could when I said, well, if your son predeceases you, she was horrified that the thought had never crossed her mind and she needed a couple of minutes. Well, I'm on the other side of the table. So I understand that suddenly it strikes you that your children might not outlive you. And that is quite something to have to consider or that you might need guardians for your younger children because something awful has happened to you. I did work on an estate where um, there was a plane crash and the four family members sadly all died in that plane crash and they died in test state. So as emotional a journey as making a will can be and estate planning, um, really need to do it because we all go out we all drive we all just walk down the road none of us knows so it is as upsetting as some people can find it some people find it empowering i'm still in charge i'm going to call the shots others not quite there yet but i know with um, the help of you know the right solicitor or support you know it can um, it can be made much easier and as you said you know honesty and yeah it can be quite yeah. um, quite a relief I think knowing that um, you're taking the pressure off people that you're leaving behind to have to try and sort it out themselves so um, yep. I've got another question here about um, agricultural land and inheritance tax Right, this isn't an area I deal with a lot. We have a, um, a, a specialist um, agricultural team that tends to deal with this, but I will try my best. So um, there is a relief that applies to agricultural land, um, agricultural relief. It's got requirements that you need to um, hit to be able to qualify for it. Um, it tends to usually involve things like growing crops, um, certain trees that are planted, but um, it might not cover things like farm equipment and machinery. Um, you also have to have um, farmed the land and occupied it for a qualifying period to um, receive it. It's often used quite a lot alongside business property relief because the agricultural relief won't necessarily cover the development value of the land. So you might have to use business property relief alongside it. Um, it is one that for a lot of farming families, normally when they're sorting out their um, partnership agreements, um, they potentially also look at agricultural relief, business property relief and do tax planning in the whole. 
um, whilst then looking at where they're leaving things to in trusts and wills. So it's it's quite a niche area. It's not one I deal with a lot. We have a specialist team at Ashton's that tend to deal with it a bit more. So I'm, I'm sorry, I can't answer that question in a lot more detail right now. It might be something that you find quite useful with um, when we send you follow up from here, the details on how to book your free 30 minutes um, with Ashton's legal team. It might be something that you might be able to use that, um, that time slot for. So um, we've got another question here. What's the most unusual wishes you've had with having creating a will? Uh, well, for me, I suppose it was somebody wanted to go off um, a boat or a, a little rowing boat and be buried at sea. Um, so that was quite, and I think somebody else wanted to have their ashes uh, scattered on a football ground. Um, it's those kind of things. What about you, Frankie? I think same as you, it tends to be quite a lot about funeral wishes is where the unusual requests um, usually come in. I think there has been one where um, somebody wanted their ashes to be put into a, a firework um, and then used as part of the celebration, which was quite unusual. Um, I think a lot of them tend to relate to instructions that families have to take them off on trips or... Um, I've got one person who's planned their funeral in quite a lot of depth and they've recommended the music. They've said what they want people to wear to it. They're a big football fan. So there's a lot of theme around that for, for it. So I think a lot of it tends to relate to really the funeral is where the unusual wishes come in. Yeah, the, real, the real personal stuff, the stuff that you really remember that family member by yeah. really. Yeah. Mm. That's great. OK, well, I can't see there's any more Q&A's coming in. So what we'll do is um, as I start to wrap up, we'll put the poll questions up um, and you can see there it's like, what do you think is the best age to start estate planning? Uh, again, multiple choice. While you're choosing that, I just want to take the opportunity to thank Frankie and Pat for sharing their knowledge. It's been really informative. I know I've learned stuff, so that's really great. I think we can all see what a difference having a will in place can make. Um, speaking from somebody who works for um, East Anglian Air Ambulance, I've certainly seen how some people have really made an amazing difference by deciding to leave a gift in their will to us. One in four of our missions are actually made possible thanks to that. And what an amazing legacy to leave behind to think. I said to somebody the other day who was talking about a relative who'd um, left some money in their will. And um, I told her about the one in four statistic. And we were just saying every time she now sees it go, she, when she counts to four, she'll think of her loved one when she sees it go up. So that's a, that's a really lovely thing, I think. So, um, but what we will be doing is we'll be following up this webinar with a playback. So if there's any information that you just want to hear again, you have the opportunity to do that and share with friends. There'll also be included in that your opportunity to um, have your 30 minute session. Uh, with one of the um, experienced team here at Ashton's. As I said, it is all independent advice. Um, they're, they're here basically just to share that they're not here on our part at all, um, but just to be able to help give something back to our supporters as well as um, people who already engage with them as well at the moment. So um, there will be a survey at the end of the webinar, so please, um, please remember that. I think the poll results, um, I'm not sure whether they just come down or not. Did you manage to see them, Frankie? Yeah, so um, surprisingly, actually, a lot of people have gone with the earlier category of sort of the 20s to 30s. Um, that is surprising. It's always good, um, but we tend to actually see people usually sort of more in the 30s to 40s categories, 40, a bit later on, and that usually sort of coming along. So um, as with anything, it's always a good idea to start early, but whether we get around to it in our lives is, a, is another matter. Okay. And it can be updated. That's the, you know, once you've got that plan in... And then it can be updated as you go on and your assets hopefully increase. Mm -hmm. So it is something to think about. And I think sometimes some people say, do I need to have an awful lot to make a will? Do I, you know, do I need to be rich? What's your response to that? No, you don't. You just need to be mindful of your circumstances and just get things in place. Because especially if actually if you've got minor children, then you do need to get things in place so that if anything happened to you, their, their future is 
settled at least the you know you know where they're going to live and the people that they're going to live with have also been told if anything happens to us can you be the guardians it's not some surprise on top of an early death mm -hmm. so um the the sooner you get things in place and as i said just because we say review the will every five years doesn't mean you have to do the will every five years just look at your circumstances well, thank you and i've got some feedback for you saying that um it's really been nice to hear things put in simpler terms um and now understand how they can best secure the future for those that are really important to them so just before we wrap up if you have found this useful do remember the survey and remember that we have next month got a session on lasting power of attorneys, which um, I've learned are such a, it's such an important document to have in place. Um, and then the month after that, we'll then be talking about probate and care costs, which I know is um, a conversation I have with my dad quite often um, because he doesn't really want all of his money to go on care costs. So, um, so hopefully there'll be something there that will um, be of interest to you and um, you will hope to see you again. So thank you, everybody, and have a nice afternoon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.